Hey guys, Steven here, and uh, today we're going to be doing something a little bit different than what we have been doing on this channel in the past. Um, you may notice first and foremost that I actually have a studio now, and this is something I've been waiting for for quite a while um, because of where I live, and you know, I live in a townhouse, there's not really a lot of space to do much of anything. Uh, I literally have a master bedroom, a spare bedroom, which is used for storage basically, and an office, a, but it's a rather small office, and it's pretty cluttered in here already as it is, but I was able to get a buddy of mine to come over here about a week or two ago, and he uh, is pretty good about you know sound and, and lighting and all those kind of different things that go along with shooting film or video. Um, and he helped me a great deal with, you know, finding a way to get a home studio set up for me here, despite the limited space. So just want to give a shout out to him for for all that he was able to, to accomplish on, on my behalf. And uh, he has a YouTube channel as well. It's not related at all to astronomy or astrophotography, but if you happen to like stop motion film, particularly with Lego sets. Um, if you nerd out and that kind of stuff, he definitely has a cool channel that you should go and check out. Um, it's called CBL Animation. I'll provide a link for that in the description below. So thank you again for joining me here today. Um, it's been a really cloudy stretch here for us lately um, where I'm living. I really haven't seen very much sunlight in this past month. The sun was out a little bit today, um, the day that I'm filming this, but it, of course, as soon as the sun went down, the clouds started to move in, so I haven't been able to do any astrophotography work as of late for that reason. The last thing I was able to do was earlier in the month when I was doing a daytime session. You may remember the video I did on shooting Venus in the middle of the day, which I thought was just pretty cool. Um, the fact you can see anything at all in the, in the daytime is, is just mind-boggling, but you in fact can see certain bright objects in broad daylight if you know where to look and and you know what you're doing. <laughs> but So today we're going to be doing, instead of doing any astrophotography related things per se, um, because I don't have anything new to present to you guys, today we're going to do a Q&A session just so that I can briefly introduce myself to you now that I can finally do it in a formal sense um, while I'm talking to you directly. Uh, again, I, this is something I wanted to do for a while and I'm super thankful that I finally have the opportunity to do this. Um, so today I'm going to be answering some questions about myself and just so that you guys get to know me a little bit better. So without any further ado, here we go. I would say I was probably around seven or eight years old when I first started to uh, notice things related to space and astronomy. Uh, I remember when, shortly after my grandpa died, um, I was around seven years old at the time. Um, my mother, for whatever reason, I remember her letting me play with an old monocular that she happened to to, ha to get from from my grandpa, uh, her father, and and I remember just playing with it, and I was, and I remember one time, I guess I took notice of the moon, and of course, around that time, I was starting to, to pick up on the fact that the moon looks different from day to day. It goes through phases, and as a kid, I thought, this is just an incredible thing, you know, that, that, that the moon shows itself differently every day and so well it became a target of fascination for me and i remember just looking up at it pointing at it with my with this binocular telescope which i unfortunately no longer have i've tried looking for it it's not in anywhere in my house my mother has tried looking for it at my parents house and she hasn't been able to find it either to both of our dismays because it means a lot to her because it came from her father 
it's a really it was a really old antique binocular too not you know they don't make them like that anymore in other words um and i and it means a lot to me because well that's how i got my feet wet in astronomy for the first time um so that aside so that was around that age when i started to become interested and i wanted to know more about astronomy i wanted to learn about the planets the stars uh, more about our moon so it was around this time period when I remember going to my school library. This is this is the late '90s, so the internet was still a little bit harder to come by. Um, actually, quite a bit harder to come by. I we didn't have a computer yet in my house growing up at, the, at that time. So the only way I can have access to the internet is if I was at school and I was using the computer lab. More on that in a second, but. But I remember going to my school library and checking out different books that were related to space or astronomy. And I remember just sitting there reading them and was just so drawn to what I was learning that I was just absorbing it like a sponge. I remember just, I want to know all the various facts about all the different planets, you know, from Mercury. In those days, all the way to Pluto. Plus, Pluto was considered a planet still back then. It's and now it's you know they they demoted it to a dwarf planet, which I have mixed feelings about. If I'm gonna be honest about it, I understand why they did that, but you know it is what it is, right? Well, so I just remember just really wanting to know as much as I could about space, and and I remember also going to the computer lab whenever I had the chance and I remember just plugging away just google searching anything related to space or astronomy and so I would look at different at various websites that were related to that and I again would just absorb anything I could and of course just be drawn and mesmerized by all the photography that I was looking at just the pictures of the planets that were from the Voyager spacecrafts for, for example um it was just mind-boggling to me just to see that there are worlds out there that are outside our own world. That blew my mind away as an eight-year-old boy. I just was like, wow. <laughs> you know. But anyway. So. I remember also. Getting another telescope as a gift for Christmas. I think it was, oh, I would say probably around 2000-ish, maybe, maybe 99, somewhere around in there, I remember getting my first ever real telescope that was not a binocular, but was actually made for astronomy. It was one of those old Tascos, which, you know, that's how a lot of us start out. I, it was your classic 6700 refractor. Um, you know, it, it's not it's not the greatest in the world, especially since that particular telescope came with eyepieces that, quite frankly, were were crappy. Okay, they were not suited well for that particular telescope, and they made things far far too magnified and pushed the telescope beyond its optical limits. So, but it was still a very fine telescope for starting out and. That's how I, for example, saw Jupiter for the first time, when I saw Saturn for the first time with my own eyes and realizing, wow, you know, this is what these things actually look like in real time as I'm looking at them. Of course, well, you know, they're several hours old already when I'm looking at it because of the speed of light and all that. But as far as I was concerned as, an, as a boy, I'm looking at this and as is, it, you know, as it is currently out there right now in real time and... It just, I just, I was just blown away by that. So yeah, that was how, that was how old I was when I started getting into astronomy. And there's a lot more I could say about that, but I'll just leave it at that for now. That's a really difficult question to, to narrow down. Um, <laughs> I mean... Again, the, all these things were happening in a relatively close time frame. Um, that seven, eight, nine-year-old, you know, around, around around that age. But I would say for sure there was one thing in particular that I do remember that really helped take you know my interest in, in astronomy to a whole new level. And 
So one time I remember I was out shopping with my mother and we were at the local grocery store and for whatever reason we had to stop by the pharmacy section and as we were walking um, down this aisle to get to the pharmacy, to, to the actual pharmacy, it, um, we had to stop, we had to pass through um, this aisle that had, well, the magazine rack. Um, and it was where they were keeping all the magazines and books and stuff like that. And I remember, I don't know, I, I guess I was looking over that way as I was walking with my mom, and I remember out of the corner of my eye, I this one particular magazine caught my attention. And I'll never forget it. I still have it with me to this day. Um, and it happens to be the September 2000 issue of Sky and Telescope magazine. And I remember seeing something on here that was like, wow, I relate to this because you know, it features what? The, the title was, Where Are All the Young Astronomers? Um, how to Get Children Away from the Television and and Looking Up at the Stars. And it features, obviously, a um, a young girl with a giant telescope. And I, in a way, it really struck a chord with me because I'm like, that really describes me. I like looking at the stars. Um, and... And I was just fascinated with it, and I asked my mom if we can get the magazine, and she, you know, she uh, went ahead and got it for me. And I remember when we went home, I opened this up and I started reading through it, and wow, it like overnight my interest in, in this hobby just went to a whole new level, and you know everything from current astronomical events, uh, featured photography. Um, to um, looking at what's up in the sky for that particular month, just kind of knowing where the stars are, where the planets are, um, all that information, and all, all in one place. Of course, it's very easy to take that for granted now in the, in the age of social media and the internet and all that, but you gotta remember, this is a time when, again, those things were not as accessible to me and we didn't have a computer yet at home, so, you know, this was the way in which I learned how to read sky charts because Sky and Telescope would issue sky charts every month in their magazines. At least it did back then. I don't know if they still do that now, but that was how I learned to read the sky charts. And I, I taught myself how to how to understand magnitudes, how to um figure out basically how to read them, how to know, okay, this is telling me that these stars are in this part of the sky in this time of the year at this time of the day and all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, now, of course, at that age, I'm not going to understand more sophisticated information such as, you know, astronomical coordinates, like right essential dec declination and all that. I think I understood what azimuth and alt altitude was. I was able to kind of figure that out, but not so much the other thing, but I digress. So yeah, this that magazine really um, was a catalyst for me in a very big way. And I remember I wanted to read more. I remember putting it down. I was like, yeah, I have to get next month's issue. And then I did. And, and it just, and, and it, and it kind of just went from there. My dad eventually, you know, ordered a, you know, subscription for Sky and Telescope that lasted for several years. I think it wasn't until probably three or four years later or so when he uh, canceled it because by that time I wasn't really reading him anymore. I'll explain that um, in a little bit here, but but the fact is is that it really did stay with us for for quite a while um, as a family. Um, and it was all because seeing a, another child interested in astronomy just caught my attention. It, it resonated with me. So yeah, that was how I became interested in, in astronomy. So that's all the questions I had for today, for today's video anyway. Um, I didn't really get anything specifically relating to astrophotography because I'm going to do that in the next video. 
I'm going to do another Q&A type session there, but I'm going to focus specifically on the, the hobby of astrophotography. And, and so until then, um, thank you guys for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe if you really enjoyed what you, what you watched and you want to see more like it. And hope you guys stick around and wait to see what happens when I finally am able to get out there and do some mass photography work. I'm just oh, dying to get out there again to get set up and it just hasn't been possible. But I hope to do that again soon. I'm still hoping to to capture um, the comment that's making all the headlines lately. That comment C2022E3, I think it's what it's called. Um, it's been all over social media as far as um, any astronomy related news goes. Um, so I for, for certainly want to capture it for sure. And thankfully it looks like we might finally see a break in the clouds in the cloudy pattern, possibly as early as this coming Wednesday. Um, it's going to be really cold though. We're looking at possible negative teens Fahrenheit for a low that night. So it's going to be a very chilly setup, but at this point I'm desperate to do anything I can to, to capture a rare comment that will surely never be seen again in our lifetimes. Not this particular comment anyway. So hopefully I'll finally catch a break then and be able to capture it. I know that the phase of the moon might be problematic because it'll be a waxing gibbous by that point in time. And of course those tend to be very, they tend to wash out fine, finer objects in the, in the night sky when, the, when that, that moon is out there like that. Um, but if it's all I can do, it's all I can do. I'll do the best I can to see what I can come up with. That's still my hope anyway. I'm still hoping to to, to um, get what I can out of that comments. But until then, again, thanks for watching. And I'll see you guys next time. Clear skies and cheers.